On October 31st, 1996, disaster would strike in Brazil's largest city. TAM Airlines Flight 402 crashed immediately after taking off, leading to the deaths of nearly 100 people in what became one of Brazil's deadliest aviation disasters, and also the deadliest to involve that particular plane. So what happened? Clearly, the pilots at some point during this short flight lost control of their plane. But really, how does that happen at such a critical phase of flight? That is what we're going to explore today. Sao Paulo's Congonhas Airport is a place we have already discussed on the channel. As a recap, this airport, located in the heart of Sao Paulo, one of the largest cities in the entire world, serves upwards of 10 million passengers every year, making it one of the busiest in Brazil. Why this airport is so interesting is despite how busy this place can get, it is also extremely small for such traffic. The runways are notorious for their short length. The massive urbanization that surrounded Congonhas Airport over the years left very little room for expansion. Because of this, Congonhas Airport was somewhat limited in the types of planes that could fly there and became more of a regional hub than an international airport. A much larger airport at Sao Paulo exists in the north of the city to handle its international traffic. Congonhas was at least of an ideal size for the plane we need to discuss today, the Fokker 100. 51 of these Dutch manufactured planes found themselves as part of the fleet for TAM Airlines, one of the largest air carriers in Brazil at the time behind Barig. TAM introduced them to their fleet from 1990, making up a large portion of their regional fleet. The Fokker 100 was developed from the earlier built Fokker 28, which brought about its own set of issues. If one peers down the hole that is the history of Fokker, you will inevitably find yourself dropping deeper and deeper into a proverbial rabbit hole of seemingly no end. Something that is best saved for another day. The Fokker 100 itself was very popular in Europe. 283 of them were built up until the demise of Fokker in the late 1990s. The accident Fokker 100 of today's discussion was registered as Papa Tango Mike Romeo Kilo. At the time, it had recently been painted in a special livery, promoting the fact that TAM Airlines had recently won an award for Best Regional Airline by Air Transport World magazine, as indicated by the lettering on the livery. On the morning of October 31st, 1996, this plane was to fly between Sao Paulo and Recife, with a stopover in Rio de Janeiro. This first leg of the trip is perhaps one of the most widely traveled air routes in not only the country of Brazil, but also the entire world, with multiple flights every hour between the two cities during peak hours. For the pilots, it was a routine day. 35-year-old Captain Jose Antonio Moreno was very well experienced in the Fokker 100, with over 3,000 hours in the type. By the time of the accident, he had accumulated over 9,000 hours in total. He was joined on the flight deck that morning by the younger 27-year-old first officer, Ricardo Luis Gomez, who was, in contrast to the captain, very new to the plane. Some sources stating he had been in the cockpit of the plane for just one week. Still, he was an experienced pilot with over 4,000 total hours logged. In the cabin of Flight 402 were 89 passengers and four flight attendants for a total of 95 people on board. Leaving the gate, the Fokker plane was taxied to the north side of the airport for a southerly departure, where the plane soon lined up on runway 17 right. Immediately after takeoff, Flight 402 would fly over the Jabaquara suburb of Sao Paulo. The time was 8.26 as Flight 402 was cleared for takeoff. Brazil is rather open about disclosing cockpit voice recordings of air disasters in the country. Available to us today is the cockpit voice recording of this very short flight. I feel the best way to unpack this accident is to run through it and break down how this takeoff unfolded and what went wrong as it happened. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay
The tone that can be heard in the recording here is an alert to signal to the pilots that the auto throttle was non-functional. We'll come back as to why that happened soon. During a takeoff, pilots need to be incredibly attentive to their aircraft so that they can reject a takeoff should something go wrong. To the pilots, what appeared to be an auto throttle malfunction was not that important to abort the takeoff for. It just means that the pilots would have to handle the throttle controls manually. The pilots continued their takeoff. Having hit the V1 speed, they have effectively committed themselves to takeoff from this point. Seconds later, the plane would be angled into the air. Almost immediately, as the plane was less than 100 feet into the air, the pilots began noticing problems. But to unpack what those problems were, we need to understand what was happening in the rear of the plane. The Fokker 100 features a typical regional jet design, with its two engines mounted at the rear of the fuselage next to the tail fin. A sensor which governs the deployment of the reverse thrust on the right side number 2 engine had begun failing intermittently, signaling to deploy and retract. Reverse thrust comes in a multitude of different configurations depending on the airplane. On the Fokker 100, the reverse thrust utilizes the bucket configuration, similar to that of similarly designed planes like the DC-9 or MD-80. Two large buckets deploy from behind the engines to redirect thrust forward to slow a plane down on landing. As you'd probably expect, they are not ever supposed to be used in flight. In 1991, Lauda Air Flight 4 crashed shortly after takeoff from Bangkok following an uncommanded reverse thrust deployment. That disaster killed 223 people, highlighting just how deadly this can be. The reason this can be dangerous is because of how reverse thrust affects an aircraft's aerodynamic performance. If one side is performing as normal and the other side is producing opposing thrust, a great yawing effect can occur, which could make the plane increasingly difficult to control for pilots. For the reverse thrust to be activated, there are multiple checks that should be met. On the Fokker 100 and other planes, sensors that measure weight and spin on the wheels should guarantee that reverse thrust can only be deployed when a plane is on the ground, not in the air. These checks failed on flight 402, and the reverse thrust for the number 2 engine was signaled to deploy, the buckets first opening and closing, before opening back up staying in the deployed position. In this accident, two rolling events occurred. Following the first roll after the reverse thrust first deployed, the captain was able to bring the plane under control for a short time, counteracting the roll with the rudder controls. There is another huge aspect to this disaster that must now be discussed. When the Fokker 100 was designed, they brought in an additional safety measure that would dictate that should an uncommanded opening of the reverse thrust occur, the throttle control for that engine is automatically reduced to idle without pilot intervention. This safety system had overridden the throttle control, switching off the auto throttle, which explains those alerts during the takeoff roll, indicating that the faulty sensor failed during the takeoff, but then commanded the reverse thrust to deploy once the plane was in the air. The pilots would never make a mention on the cockpit voice recorder about the fact that the reverse thrust had just been deployed on their number 2. Instead, it is believed that they thought they had an issue with their auto throttle, as heard when the chimes sounded in the cockpit. The pilots were clearly confused about their situation. Things would go from bad to much worse, as because they thought they had an auto throttle problem, Therefore, when it was noticed that the number 2 engine throttle was set to idle, the first officer increased it back up to full power. Again, the plane would respond 
and bring it back down to idle automatically. It was pushed forward again by the pilots. They misunderstood what the plane was doing. It is believed that the first officer had overridden that secondary safety measure by effectively breaking a cable which connects the throttle with the reverser. The plane wanted to pull the throttle back, the first officer wanting to do the opposite. The cable broke from its connections from the opposing forces of the plane and the pilot. When this occurred, the throttle stayed at maximum thrust. In the end, when the reverse thrust buckets were deployed to fully open, full thrust was applied to that engine, creating the second roll that the pilots would not recover from. Flight 402 rolled hard over to the right, eventually the nose dropping below the horizon. Tam Airlines Flight 402 crashed into the Jabaquara suburb of Sao Paulo, killing all 95 people on board. In the final moments before impact, the plane flew over, narrowly missing a school before it crashed around here on Luis Orsini de Castro Street. A further four people on the ground were killed as the crash left the neighborhood devastated, multiple homes destroyed in the disaster. TAM Airlines continued to operate the Fokker 100 for years after the accident. They introduced new pilot training to teach pilots what to do in a case of an uncommanded reverse thrust deployment because the investigation found out that the pilots were never trained for it. I feel having discussed another accident previously that this story goes a bit deeper. Fokker has had a bit of a history regarding the deployment of reverse thrust in flight partly involving one of their other planes, the Fokker 50. In 1988, it was revealed to Fokker that electromagnetic interference could send faulty information across various parts of the plane, including that plane's own safety system that was supposed to prevent the deployment of reverse thrust in flight. So, Fokker sent out a non-binding notice to airlines recommending that this electrical fault be fixed. Because it was non-binding, it was down to individual airlines to make this change. It was deemed the likelihood of this electrical fault actually occurring to be so unlikely that no further action was implemented by Fokker. That same philosophy was brought into the flight training of the Fokker 100. What transpired on TAM Flight 402 was also considered to be so unlikely that pilot training for reverse thrust deployment was not required. Those pilots that day never trained for the scenario that took their lives. With regards to that other Fokker plane, disaster struck again on November 6, 2002. Luxair Flight 9642 crashed on its approach into Luxembourg. Pilot error compounded against an inadvertent deployment of reverse thrust in flight. The investigation made a note about that non-binding notice that Fokker sent out to airlines following its discovery of reverse thrust failure, a fix that Luxair never enforced. 20 people lost their lives that day. If you want to learn more about that accident, be sure to check out the video we already have on it. Fokker collapsed in 1996, actually several months before TAM 402. The remaining planes that were constructed were sold to airlines with improvements made to its reverse thrust mechanisms, and the plane never suffered a failure like this again. Over the years, the Fokker 100 flew in various parts of the world, but have slowly been phased out in Europe and the Americas. Most of the planes still flying today can actually be found in Australia of all places. But we are not done talking about Fokker. There is something else we need to talk about regarding this defunct Dutch company that is absolutely best saved for another day. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I know I am posting this on a Tuesday and that is because this week we are doing two videos. I guess this one being the additional one. There is still going to be another video this weekend as normal. We do these from time to time, once every few months or so there will be an extra surplus of a video in the production pipe of sorts, so when they arise you get another video on a Tuesday. 
Anyway, a thanks to my patrons, as always. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a massive thanks to you for supporting the channel. If you are interested in joining the Patreon and supporting Disaster Breakdown, you can do so via the link in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube, and you can join from just £1 per month. I'm keeping this outro short this time, I'm off back to work, trying to work out some tweaks with Train Simulator. I never wanted this rail video to take this long, but I am having to bend some of my rules to get the reconstruction for the video a bit. Anyway, I'll update you on that when that video gets closer to release. With all that said, I'm going to leave it there. If you want to follow my personal Twitter, that will be in the video's description if you want. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you on Saturday. Goodbye!